Hey, welcome from Commando.com. This is Commando On Demand, where we talk to industry movers and shakers to keep you up to date on everything digital. First up, I'd like to say a quick thank you to the partners who help make these Commando On Demand podcasts possible. How much did that hurt? Didn't really hurt a lot. A third holding off for now. It kind of freaks me out a little bit. All right, so what are they talking about? It sounds like something from this futuristic sci-fi Hollywood flick. But believe it or not, some employees are voluntarily, even enthusiastically, taking their employers up on the offer to implant tiny computer chips about the size of a grain of rice right into their bodies. Yeah, it's true. Why would anyone want to do something so invasive with even potential health risks? Why would any employee want to go along with it? Well, most importantly, if your employer ever asked your permission to install a microchip directly in you, in your body, what would you say? Would you even have a choice if you wanted to keep your job? Well, some see this as the next logical step in efficiency, productivity, and security. Others warn it's the next step down the road to that frightening 1984 Big Brother society so many people have warned us about for years. And think about the implications of these chips. Can they be used to track employees? Is this practice, as some people have said, surveillance by convenience? Is there potential sinister intent? And what about the results? I'm America's Digital Pro, Kim Commando. And we're going to take a deep dive into this disturbing new idea. And I've got the information you need to understand the technology and how to make a decision about how you would even respond if your employer came up to you and said, Hey, how are you, Bob? How about we inject you with a little microchip this afternoon? You love your job, don't you? Before we can start talking about microchips and technology, we have to talk a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes. And for that, we have to turn to RFID and how it's being used. So to talk RFID, Mark Roberti, he's the founder and editor of RFID Journal. This guy is a total expert on the tech who can give us an idea about what it is, how it really works, and how people are using it. So, Mark, welcome to Commando On Demand. Thanks, Kim. Appreciate you having me on. I'm so glad that you took some time out to speak with us because, as we all know, the technology RFID, it's not brand spanking new. We've been using it for a long time. And most of us actually use RFID every single day, but we don't think about what it is. So let's start at the very beginning. So we're all on the same page. Give us a quick definition of RFID. What does it stand for? What actually is it? Sure. Uh, So RFID stands for radio frequency identification, and that's sort of a broad term like computer, and it covers all kinds of systems for identifying and tracking objects remotely using radio waves. So most people are familiar with um, an active, a battery-powered RFID system that's used in toll collections. So you get a little transponder with a battery in it, you pop that onto your windshield, and then you go through the toll. Um, It sends a signal to a reader and has a unique serial number embedded in it, and that serial number is associated with your account, and you get billed uh, automatically uh, in your account for that um, uh, that trip. So uh, there's also a passive ver- version of RFID, which is a, a, a transponder without a battery. It gets energy from the reader. The reader sends out radio waves. Uh, the, the antenna on the chip collects these radio waves, stores it as a little bit of energy, and then sends back a signal, a unique serial number to a reader, and that's uh, uh, associated with an object or associated with an account. So, for example, if you use Apple Pay um, or any other uh, kinds of payment systems with your phone, that's uh, an RFID system. Um, if you use a mobile speed pass at the gas station, that's RFID. If you use a card to get into your building where you put the card next to the reader, the door opens, that's RFID. And of course, pretty much every car manufactured today um, has an RFID immobilizing system in the steering column. So um, if you remember, if you're as old as me and you remember keys didn't used to have a plastic 
uh, housing around the top of them. And the reason they have that plastic housing now is it, it holds an RFID transponder. When you put your key in, um, there's a reader in the steering column that says, hey, what's your serial number? Your key says, my serial number is one, two, three, four, five. And you say, okay, that's right, it starts the car. If you went to um, a restaurant, somebody copied your key, uh, but didn't copy the transponder, which is not that easy to do, and you just stuck the key in and fit perfectly, it still wouldn't start the car. It would turn, but it wouldn't start the car because the serial number wasn't communicated to the RFID system, and the RFID system would tell the car, hey, don't start up. Let's just say you're not new at this. In August of 2016, you wrote a really interesting op-ed for the Wall Street Journal. It was called how tiny wireless tech makes workers more productive. I mean, think about that. How tiny wireless tech is going to make workers more productive. I said it again because it sounds like a Hollywood movie. It sounds like a bad science fiction short story or maybe a good one. And in this op-ed, you describe the efficiencies and the increase in productivity that RFID technology has actually brought to us. And the numbers that you cite even just a few years ago are stunning today. Here's just one example. Since 2011, Delta Airlines has installed more than 240,000 tags on its oxygen generators, life vests, and other emergency equipment on the airplanes. And you go on to say that it used to take eight man hours to check the expiration dates on the oxygen generators aboard a 757. Okay. Now, that same job, instead of eight man hours, takes less than two minutes. Crazy. Um, it actually is true, and I can tell you that uh, I have been on an, uh, a Delta Airlines plane and held a handheld. And uh, essentially what you do is you walk down the aisle with this handheld. You don't even have to wave it around. Just walk down the aisle and it reads um, the transponder on every single life vest and oxygen container in the system. And what they do is they they basically have it pre-populated. So it it expects to get these serial numbers because we we know these oxygen containers are on um, uh, the plane and and, and you read them and it just kind of ticks them off. Yes, 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 we got them. Um, Happens very quickly. And and one of the interesting things is that um, the airplane is metal and radio waves bounce off of metal. So what happens is the reason you don't have to wave the reader around is uh, the reader emits these radio waves and they bounce all over the plane and they go to the tags and then they come back to the reader. Um, They may bounce off, you know, the side of the plane. Um, But, you know, it, it. it's, it, it's really pretty amazing when you when you do it. It's, uh, it's quite an experience. It sounds like magic. Okay, Mark, you're enthusiastic about all this technology, aren't you? Uh, that would be an understatement, actually. Okay, I want to share something with our listeners from you. You mentioned that you could use these chips to get into an office building. You could then leave your ID card at home, and you don't have to swipe anymore. If you happen to have one of these chips implanted right in your hand, Well, you could just hold that up to the reader, and some companies are doing that today. There was another op-ed column in the Washington Times, August 2018, in which the author says, when convenience comes downright creepy, she writes, referring to people praising the convenience, being able to log into computers and get into their offices using these chips. Those who take the implant think that the two seconds they save Typing their password onto their computer screens are well worth the trade-off of losing privacy and compromising their personal data. You know, that's pretty telling. Think about that. Instead of, like, typing in your password anymore, you just swipe your hand. And people love that. How do you respond to that? Um, Well, personally, uh, I think implanting RFID chips in people is creepy as well. Um, It's not something I advocate. It's not something I think has much practical value. Um, I know that some people have done it. Um, I know that um, there have been uh, some talk of legislation to prevent companies from requiring it. I've never heard of a company requiring it, but but some uh, legislators at least a few years ago had talked about um, making it um, illegal to require people to do that, and that's something I would favor. It's, it's not something that I think companies should do. Um, on the other hand, I would say um, that there's not much loss of privacy. 
Um, so the chip that you implant in a person has a read range of about uh, six inches, maybe tops one foot. So there's really no chance that somebody is going to track you using something that can only be read from about six inches away, right? You could use binoculars and track someone. You could use their cell phone and track them from miles away. Why would you use a technology that can only track them from a few inches? As we look around all 50 states, five states outlaw requiring the chips. But it's hard to imagine that any employer would make it mandatory. Well, at least not today. So you're a proponent of RFID technology. You've written so eloquently about it and how it's helped to boost productivity, including describing how Macy's has used it to track inventory. And it's not just Macy's. The NFL is using it to track the path of football storing games. But what's the most unusual way that companies, that people have used this RFID technology? And I'm sure it's not one size fits all, right? Um. There are, you know, so many, so many different um, applications that are bizarre. I, I, I would say probably the most unique is identifying the location of tumors, uh, breast tumors in patients. Oh. Um, so one of the challenges that um, folks have when they have a breast tumor is that you, you do a, a radiation treatment, um, but it's hard to pinpoint the exact location of the, of the tumor in 3D within the body. And so w what someone has figured out is that by injecting the tumor with a very, very tiny microchip about the size of um, a, a grain of rice, um, you can then very, very precisely identify the location of the tumor in three dimensions and very accurately target the radiation so that you hit the tumor and not the surrounding tissue. Um, so that's, that's one of the, 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 the more unusual um, applications that, uh, that we've seen. The, one, the implantable chips have to obviously be small. You don't want to uh, implant something large in, 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 in a person, but there are uh, you know, ones that are a few millimeters and then a little bit larger and a little bit larger depending on, on the application. So, for example, uh, another application that's a little unusual is, is tracking salmon going upstream uh, for conservation purposes, right? You want to understand how many salmon uh, ran this year through this, uh, through this river compared to last year so that if there's a decline, we can, we can address, you know, what's the issue, why, why, are they, why is the salmon population declining? Those have to be a little bit bigger because um, if the salmon are moving quickly, they're in water, um, they may not be as close to the antenna as six inches. So, so by having a little bit larger uh, capsule that, that can be implanted in the fish, uh, you can read it from a little bit further away. So there are slight differences in the size, but anything that's implantable is going to be very, very tiny and have a very, very short read range. Thanks, Mark, from RFID Journal. He's the founder and editor and just an all-around expert on RFID technology. Thanks for joining us today on Command On Demand and sharing your expertise. It was great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So now we understand a lot more about RFID technology and what these chips are capable of doing. So let's get to the real reason we're here. That is to roll back the curtain on the controversial idea of employers injecting these tiny computer chips into their employees. Normally, it's gonna be right in your hand somewhere, say on the top of your hand, above your thumb. And to get to the heart of the matter, we're gonna speak with Patrick McMullen, He's the co-founder and president of Three Square Market and Three Square Chip Companies. They caused this total media and internet firestorm back in August of 2017, when it became one of the first companies to implant these chips in willing employees on a large scale. So we're gonna talk about how they came up with this idea. What was the most memorable reaction he got when he actually approached employees with this? But first, a quick thank you to one of our partners who helped make these Commando On Demand podcasts possible. Okay, welcome back. We're going to now talk with 
Patrick McMullen. As I mentioned before, he's pretty big in the implantable chip news media business. He's the co-founder and president of Three Square Market and then Three Square Chip Companies. All right, Patrick, first of all, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today on Commando On Demand. Thanks for having me today, Kim. It's a pleasure. We have to tell everybody what your company does. You provide self-service kiosks to office break rooms in the United States and overseas. But you've evolved into a tech company, and you made headlines back in July of 2017 when you announced that you would cover the cost of implanting RFID chips in your employees. Okay, I assume that you didn't come up with this idea when you were drinking beer with your buddies and bowling. So where did it come from? It was we saw that it was technology that was just significantly underdeveloped and underutilized. And when we when we looked and said, boy, what you could do by taking this technology, bringing it up to modern standards and the solutions that you could create with it in a wide range of, of fields, we said, why not us? And so we took it on and we went headfirst into this. I remember reading about this. Didn't a member of your team actually go to Sweden and then partner with a company? And the company's name was Biohacks. That's B-I-O-H-A-X, by the way. Yes, we initially, that it was more of a, a discussion and a get to know each other when we looked at it because when we have self-checkout stores in Sweden, Biohacks is in one of the buildings that we're in. They said, hey, Patrick, can could we pay with RFID? I said, yes. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, that RFID chip t- is embedded in our hands. And I said, whoa, wait, whoa. Just like many people, when they heard the story, they said, hey, that that's kind of out there. And it was the eye opener that you know, when we started to not only look at pain with your hand, but what else could you do that we really took off. But all of the developments and all the ideas and everything has been completely by us. There is, while I, I certainly admire what he's doing and in his mission, ours is completely different, completely separate. All right. I have to ask you, Patrick, and be honest. Do you personally have one of these chips? Yes, Kim, I got chipped live on the Today Show in front of millions of people. So either I I was going to be famous for getting it done or famous for passing out. Thankfully, I I did it. Okay, so you haven't had a craving for loot fish or anything after getting the Swedish-inspired chip implanted? I will have to tell you, the little candy Swedish fish are my favorite. Given given I'm originally from Minnesota uh, and and the Norwegian-Scandinavian heritage that's dominant up there, it could have been, but no, I don't think so. Not a, I'm much more into uh, the, the, they have some great cuisine over there and their, their idea of hospitality is amazing. Okay, so you get this idea from Sweden and then you want to repurpose it and you want to make it your own. So you think to yourself, hey, I've got this amazing idea we should try. All right, I have to tell you, as a small business owner, I can just imagine where I'm having one of these company get-togethers, a luncheon, and we're sitting there in the mezzanine and we're talking to Chef John about what he's going to be serving, the chicken tacos. And I say, hey, you know what? Before you eat, I have an idea to run by you all. What do you think? So how'd you say it to them? Well, it, it, I have to tell you, is the inspiration for this actually came from them. We sat and looked at what they were doing and said, boy, this is technology that could do a lot of different things. And especially if you got functions that, let's say, that we took on. You can unlock a door with an RFID chip. You can unlock a computer, but you can't make Currently today, it's not done in sequence. So we bridged the gap and said, well, let's not let you log into your computer unless you logged into the door. So we, we looked at that and said, boy, that's something. Well, then we took it and said, well, you could also do a lot of other things medical thing, uh, medical technology that you could do, identity, payments, and the critical piece that I'll give credit where credit is due that they were doing over in Sweden was, okay, it's me. That chip is mine. It's, in, it's implanted. And we said, well, listen, if we want to understand the limits or the non-limits that this could go to, 
we need to be willing to do it ourselves. And one of our, that's what some of our developers who at the end of the day, they're our innovators said, gosh, we should do this. If we're gonna, if we're gonna develop it, then we need to be willing to do it ourselves. And we all looked at each other and said, okay. <laughs> And to say the least, uh, it, it the rest is history. So it really actually was, give credit to the people that started the idea, it was our software developers that said it, let's do this. And, and then we all jumped in and it, it caught fire. So you had to have some cheerleaders for your idea. Who jumped in? Was it the software developers? Yes. Uh, if, and if you see any of the press coverage, some of the people that are most enthusiastic, not only in getting their chip, but at talking since to, to various media forums is, is our software development team and some of our employees. I mean, they are they're constantly asking me, what's next? Let's go. When are you going to get that done? I could just imagine what some of our team members would say to me. I mean, um, did you get any pushback, any shocked reactions from the employees? Did anybody just look at you and say, okay, come on, you've got to be kidding, right? Yes, I'd, I'd be, and I'd be a lying, uh, ignorant fool if I didn't think that that was, that there's some people even still today that, that it worked for us, obviously. Uh, but certainly in the general public that thinks we're crazy. The reality is, is that I stress up, I mean, I have someone that, that, that works directly for me. She's my executive project manager. She is a critical function in, in leading our businesses to help me and make sure that we execute on, on our goals. Up until literally two weeks ago, I did not know, and as I talked to her three, four times a day, I did not know if she was chipped or not. And so we need, the people that say, I think it's crazy because you know, we have a booming business outside of this. I need those employees just as much now as I did then. And I, I stress to people, listen, uh, have your opinions. That's, that's it, it, who am I to tell you how to think? If you don't agree with it, you think I'm nuts, that's okay. Let's continue to, to accomplish your goals. And as far as people in the general public, all I ever ask people is don't judge without information. All right, think back. What was the most interesting reaction that you got when you first brought up the idea? Not one of the software developers, not them, but someone else who was not on that team. Well, it's not so much as the first is the most memorable for me was literally 20 minutes before I was chipped live on the air, as I said, and, and I have to admit, I was a little nervous. I had an employee come up to me and say, Patrick, should I, should I get chipped today or not? And I said, no. And they looked at me is with this dumbfounded look and the reaction came like you just gave, like, are you serious? And I said, yes, I, the answer is no. And they said, well, you're about ready to get shipped in 20 minutes. And I said, if you're asking me, tells me you're not sure. And until you're sure, the answer is no. And the reality is, is that's what I want to, you know, people were looking for affirmation from others and my, you have to be bought in yourself. It's, I, I don't want you to be sold by somebody else to do it. And that person then became a big advocate that day and since. Make sure you arrive at the decision on your own based upon how you were raised, what your beliefs are, so forth. Don't allow others to influence you and don't even allow you know, the direction and the, and the vision of the company to to, to misguide you. You have to be at peace with it because no, it's 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 not some, yeah, can I pop this thing out? I can, but boy, it's going to hurt. And I don't want to, uh, it's just not, it's just not that simple. And so it, it's a decision you need to be comfortable and certain about. And that's, so that's my most memorable one. And I think today that's the theme of our organization is only do it if you're certain about it and if you and arrive at that decision on your own. Okay, that's great advice. And on the day of the actual event, that I'll call it for lack of a better term, let's call it a, a chip party in August of 2017, the media totally descended on your facility in River Falls, Wisconsin, which is a pretty small town. You probably had nearly as many media people in town that day as residents in the town. I assume you must have sent out a press release or something, maybe an invitation to the media to watch the process. 
Why did you want to publicize the program? Why did you want to get everybody's attention about it? Well, it comes down to, is, is one of the statements I, I said earlier, is, is get informed before you make a judgment. And the reality is, is in a, when you fail to provide information, people will assume a lot of things. And so given what we were doing is we did not want this to get out to where Let's say it was an employee that didn't feel that they had an avenue to not be chipped and called a local TV station, called an attorney, called somebody, and wrong information gets out. We were doing this. It was important we were doing it. And, and let's face it, I mean, I, I, if someone says, Patrick, you didn't do it for, for some marketing purposes, you're a liar. Yeah, there is some business purpose behind it. The reality was, is we, we are looking at that this is the next generation of technology and we are willing to take that risk. That, that press release and that marketing, uh, I think someday will be a book that just how to, you, know, you got to evaluate risk and make smart decisions. And when you spend $129 on a press release that generates 1.7 billion hits on your story on the web, uh, that's a pretty good investment. And I think it's a lesson and something for people to, to learn from is, you know, thinking about all the sides of everything you do involving risk, technology, taking uh, your people, uh, your, your staff it, 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 that are critical to your business and accounting for all this in something that you do. And I'll tell you, it, it, if, but do you ever think that, it, you know, Kim, did I would ever be, let's say you and I talking to, let alone all the other places and people I've talked to, no way. It, it, I never thought that it would get 1.7 billion hits. I never thought I'd be standing on a stage in Dubai 90 days later talking, to, you know, literally on the other side of the globe to 3,000 people about what we were doing. And so it's been an amazing experience, let alone it's open doors that healthy discussion like you and I are having, like I had yesterday in, in Madison, Wisconsin on what are the limits of what technology can do and where we're headed as a society. And I, I think the healthy discussion and debate, something sorely needed. And, and I, I think in some sense, that was also part of the reason that we did this, get people to start talking about what technology can do with something like this. Okay, that's true. And I wanna to talk to you about the benefits to both the employer and the employee. But I do need to mention that this program on your part is strictly voluntary. I believe that Wisconsin is one of the five states in the United States that prohibits mandatory chip implants by law, which I know doesn't matter to you because you never really wanted to make it mandatory anyway. So let's talk about the benefits of somebody getting a microchip implanted into their hand right above their thumb. What's the upside? Okay, let's start with the employee. What's the benefit if they get the chip? Convenience and you, someone may say that's a big price to play for, uh, for for convenience, but it is. And if you went to our office today, you're going to find that people have just grown to where, let's face it, in the Midwest, it's getting cold. I don't have to dig for my keys. Uh, it frees up a lot of different things. So I'm walking in a door. I'm not trying to pull my mittens off. I do is I hold my hand up to the to the to the reader and it opens. It, it, that's that's number one. I can pay with my hand. I log into my computer. I'm not having to remember a password for this and this. It's all right there, a 256-bit password. Second is security. It's, it's me. It is me. It's my information. It's not somebody else's. And it gives you peace of mind. So when you look at those two different things, convenience, security, alone, that's the benefit to the employee. Okay, let's turn the chip over. What about to the employer? What's the benefit to the company having these chips inside their employees? I mean, what are they going to really do with the data? First of all, then uh, let, let's face it, Patrick's biggest concern in the world and in the future, it, if, if you ask me, the biggest risk is, is cyber terrorism. I mean, we all hear about attacking the electrical grid could become one of the biggest th threats to our country. Well, 
For us, we're an IT company. It's, it's bringing a whole new level of certainty to network security. I don't want to say that, we're, that, 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 we're, that you can't hack. Any, I don't, anybody would say that. I think it's wrong. But I've brought a whole new level of, of certainty and security to our network by instituting what we have. And that's first and foremost in everything that we do. Secondly, is it's doing this has brought us a whole new level of innovation and innovative thinking. Now, you know, you need to think outside the box. And when we did this, obviously, we it's not only thinking outside the box, we smashed the box entirely. So it's allowed us to progress significantly as a tech company to bring all kinds of different solutions and and look at something completely different than what it ever has before. And, and I give you a case in point. I mean. If you're walking down the city streets of River Falls, Wisconsin, that fire hydrant is part of the Internet of Things. Who would ever think a fire hydrant is a part of the Internet of Things? We do, and that's the type of thinking that we have. So if a dishwasher is part of the Internet of Things, take even something more mundane, a fire hydrant, it's the Internet of Things. And that's the type of thinking that our company has benefited from is, is because we did this. Now, I don't know about you, but I have to tell you, I take my health really seriously. I haven't eaten any red meat for, gosh, I don't know, maybe like 30 years. Anything in my refrigerator is organic. It's crazy. I know. And I'm kind of OCD about it. I would be concerned about health risks involved with these implants. I know that the FDA approved them back in 2004. But are you concerned about the health risks? There have been some reports of health risks with animals that have been chipped. Since we've been implanting these chips, kind of almost, in our dogs to track them for years in case they get lost. Let's talk for a second about any potential health risks. I'm not. And I arrived at that peace of mind myself personally by meeting with numerous medical professionals, some that are even world-renowned surgeons, that... When I looked and said, here is the material, here is the construction, FDA approval, tell me what you think. And as one, one heart surgeon said to me, I've implanted over 20,000 devices in people, and that device is just as safe as those 20,000 plus devices. I have zero concern. And that's, I, I'm, I'm very confident that after these 14 years of, of this device being approved, being implanted, being used, that with anything, uh, there, there are risks that could develop, but 14 years, the pattern tells me this is extremely safe and that the health risks are minimal, if any. Okay, if you quit a company or if you get fired, all they do is they say, okay, you can't swipe your card anymore. They disable it, you can keep it, it's no big deal. But if an employee leaves, what about the chip? I mean, you can remove it, but it's actually implanted underneath your skin. So it involves a little bit of discomfort, and it kind of has that pain factor, doesn't it? If you, if I wanted to take the one out that I had implanted 14 months ago, it's probably just an extremely small incision, pops out in the same place that it was put in, and a Band-Aid. I, it's, uh, we did have two employees that have chosen to take them out of the 90... 92 that have been chipped so you get, you're down to 90 people that that we have the two that did it said it was an extremely painless and quick and easy process and it's left no permanent um, scar uh, from where it was done so if you just tried to pop it out I mean there's folks that right after they did it they popped it out that's one thing but mine forget it I mean it's it's scarred in it's like anything else it's it scarred in. It, it to get it out would take a small, very quick and minor procedure to get it out. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about the controversy that erupted when Patrick announced his chipping program. We're going to try to answer the question: Are people who are in up in arms of this program simply believing a lot of the conspiracy theories out there, or do they have a genuine point where they mention health concerns? And what about all the privacy issues? But first, we have to take a quick second and thank one of our partners in this podcast. Now, this first topic proves that the future is here, but not everyone is going to like it. 
How many of you here would have a microchip implanted in your hand, for instance, if it allowed you to do things like pay for your groceries or log on to your computer just by waving your hand? Anyone? Very soon, you may have the chance. This is obviously sounds like something like it's a cool idea for some folks, but is it too invasive? Because there's actually a firm now that offers embedded microchips to its employees so that they can do things like log into computers, pay for snacks in the vending machines. Get through a This is happening. Area. This is happening. And, and the, the volunteers, I guess there were 60 of them, who went ahead and had this chip implanted, and they're using it. Well, and the caveat, this is a Wisconsin company, corporation, and the caveat is that there's no GPS. They're not tracking your... So they says say. who? Say. Wait, wait. They say. So if, right. they, if I can pay for a snack... That they know where I am. That's true. Like, I don't. Uh-uh. My bigger concern is that this could be done ultimately against people's will at some point in mm. time. Look, we live in a very fragile society right now. Yeah. And could I you see... I don't like the way that was being done. I mean, nothing against the guy doing it, but... And it can migrate, too. Well, it can migrate, yeah. and, and you know that infections in the hand, upper extremities can be, can be devastating. I, I, don't, I don't know if I like... The scenario where they were, how they were doing it, like get in line and boom, you get your chip. Right, and that's, I mean, that's a big risk just to buy a snack from a vending machine or a log well, to a computer, right? Okay, you're back. We know that these implanted chips can make life easier for employees. I mean, think about it. No more passwords to log into computers. No more forgotten key cards. No more swiping. No more pulling out your ID out of your wallet. But as you know, there is the potential dark side involving extreme invasions of privacy. We also have ethical issues. We just heard a little bit of that during a soundbite from the syndicated TV show, The Doctors. It actually aired back in September of 2017. So let's ask our guest, Patrick McMullen from Three Square Market, the company that in August of 2017 offered willing employees the chance, the opportunity to have microchips directly implanted in their bodies, in their hands. We're gonna talk about some of those concerns. So Patrick, let's just dive right into it. As I'm sure you're aware, many people raise privacy concerns about these implanted chips. The current chips in your employees don't have GPS capabilities. More about that in a second. But even if they cannot track employees' locations when they're on their own time, what's to stop an employer from using them to track employee behavior on the job? For example, what's to stop an employer from tracking how many times a day an employee uses the restaurant? I have to tell you, that actually happened to me. One of my first jobs directly out of college was I worked for a pretty big company, a three-letter company. All right. It wasn't at t I worked for IBM. And I was on the job for about a week when my manager called me in and asked, Kim, do you have any health issues we need to know about? This was a long time ago when employers could actually ask that question. And I looked at her with my big blue eyes, fresh out of college, and said, why, what's up? And she said, well, you seem to be going to the restroom quite a bit. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. She said, well, in an eight-hour day, you're going to the restroom sometimes two or three times a day. And that is considered excessive. I explained to my then-manager that I drink a lot of water and I exercise a lot. And then it suddenly hit me. I had to swipe to get into the women's restroom. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was in the 1980s. So now you have a chip inside your body. What if your employer could take the data from the vending machine and use it to maybe change your insurance premium? Hey, you know, that Red Bull and Doritos, not good for you. You buy a lot of high fat sugary snacks, don't you? Hmm, we're gonna have to raise your health insurance premium. Just wanted to let you know, there are always apples and bananas. Great question, and it's a, it's a very good observation. And the reality is, is that that information today is already, I could do that today if I wanted to with, with people's buying patterns. And part of what got us to look and say, let's do this is 
34 billion avenues exist just today alone, just today, for your information to travel up and down every single second of every single day. And the reality is, is that's done because you have a mobile phone. The, the, the days of privacy sailed as soon as smartphones hit the world. Cell phones in general hit the world. Your privacy left, left. That ship is long gone. The trains left the station. So at using a chip, actually what I can do is in our, our vision and it's true reality is to pull your information off that superhighway. I want to control what information I release, what I don't. The chips of today, there is no GPS. You can't track me. It's not powered. It's not feasible. So there's no way to know how many times I'm in the bathroom. There's no many times no I where I'm even in the building. The, the, the payment system that we use in making payments, it's reading, it, it, it uses that process tokenization, and at the end of the day, it's not differentiating between is that a chip or is that an RFID off their, their plastic card that's in their wallet. It doesn't differentiate the two. So could it in the future? Yeah, it, and, but I, I have to stress to people, get informed. That 34 billion Avenue super highway Literally today, you open something on your mobile phone and within two seconds, you open in Facebook, where you were on your phone shows up literally one scroll down. The world knows where you are. They know who you are. They know what you're buying. They know what you're doing. The chip actually is going to give you the opportunity to take that back. And I think as we talk in our conversation, I'm going to give some very specific examples as how, how that's going to happen and how it already is happening. All right, so you at Three Square, you're working on a new chip, one with GPS capability. Will that new chip development affect any of the employees who are currently chipped? And do you have any plans, and be honest, to use it to track employees in the future? There's there's no interest in, in tracking GPS-wise our employees. Never has been, never will. What this GPS-enabled chip that we are, are developing and will have in beta testing next summer is really aimed at the medical community and Alzheimer's dementia patients. When we received all that firestorm you described in August of last year, ones that appeal to, to myself personally are, are things that really it, it, it hit the medical world. I, I personally am on a mission to, to change a lot of things in healthcare just based upon things that, that my family has gone through. So if I can do things that can make someone's life better through responsible innovation, I'm going to do that. So Alzheimer's and dementia patients, it, 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 and I, I challenge also any of the listeners to think about this, Kim, is not just think about our society, but think of other cultures. In the U.S., senior centers are very prominent, but you go to Central South America, the Caribbean, they don't exist. They, they don't believe in senior centers at all. They have multi-generational families. And as was told to me, and it's, it's hard for me to, to even say this, it's still today, it, it, I struggle to say, but I've had doctors call me from Central South America and across the globe, say that emergency rooms are like dog pounds. People with all, Alzheimer's and dementia are brought in they don't know who they are. They have no way to be identified. And they sit and they sit and they're, they're cared for until someone finds them. And what is not an issue here in the U.S. because of the, 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 that we do have. My, my, my parents live in senior housing. They don't have in other cultures. And so when you think about what we're doing and what we're talking about, it's not just limited to the 50 states that we live in. It's talking about a global solution. And so that's where when I talk about why GPS and where we want to go with that is to bring solutions that can impact the world. And so hashtag change the world is something I've had for, for the last 14 months. Okay, that's a great hashtag. Patrick McMullen of Three Square Market and Three Square Chip Companies. It's been so amazing to speak with you. I guess that we can say that you have a, <laughs> get this, a hand in changing the future. All right, sorry about that. Thanks so much for joining us here on Command On Demand, Patrick. You're awesome. Thanks for having me to Kim today. It was a pleasure. Meanwhile in Sweden, 
There are so many companies that are implanting their employees with microchips, as I mentioned, right above their thumbs. And the whole idea in Sweden, it's going to replace their ID, their keys, their train tickets, their credit cards. And the implanted microchips use near-field communication technology. It's the same technology as contactless credit cards. You just wave your hand with the chip implanted, and you can open doors, you can operate computers, buy coffee. And like here in the United States, people in Sweden are having chip parties where many employers are paying for the cost of the implant. It's about $200 a person, by the way. And there have been hiccups. Remember, this is technology. Sometimes a train passenger's LinkedIn profile shows up when they swipe their hand and not a ticket confirmation. Whoopsies. And if you ever quit a job, the chip stays in your body. So you're going to have to pay to have it removed. What about privacy? Uh, there is none. What about ethical issues, moral issues? There are just a ton. For me, I'm going to say no thank you to this technology. I'm Kim Commando, and if you enjoyed what you heard today, like it, share it, give us a great review, download it, tweet it, you get the idea. You want to share it, because after all, knowledge is power. Special thank you to our guests, Mark Rabati of RFID Journal and Patrick McMullen of Three Square Market and Three Square Chip Companies.